Welcome to the Kunsthalle Darmstadt for our third evening event in the context of the Rosilene Ludovico exhibition. We are standing here in front of the painting Heat from 2020 in the exhibition. I'm very pleased to welcome our guest today, Laimer Garcia dos Santos. Welcome, Laimer. Thank you for being here. Among the formative experiences of your inte intellectual life are your acquaintance with uh, some of the greatest French philosophers of the 20th century and your visit to a legendary Cezanne exhibition in Paris. I'm very much looking forward to your lecture. Please take a seat you already uh, took and make yourself comfortable even if there is a storm raging outside. Yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming, all of you. Uh, I will read a text because my English is not so good. So please forgive me for this uh, pronunciation, I would say. I would like to start thanking Leon Krempel and all the staff of Kunsthaus Darmstadt for inviting me to give a talk in the context of uh, Rosilene Ludovico's exhibition. I am delighted to be here, to meet you all, and to have the opportunity of experiencing Primavera in its fullness. I wrote a text for the catalog of Primavera entitled The SAT of Painting. Why the focus on thisness or SAT. It seemed to me that thisness was the core of Ludovico's art. And in order to make sensible what I was trying to say, I considered Vendaval, a series of three canvases painted in Brazil in 2018, whose images can be seen in the catalog. They are not here, but they are in the catalog. Well, visiting the exhibition the last few days, I felt very happy for having taken that parti pris, since Primavera is a wonderful and powerful experience concerning the SAT of painting. From the start to the end, Everything converge both to the contemplation of thisness as the event and to the event as pure contemplation. What SAT is and how can we grasp the SAT of painting or thisness of painting? The philosopher Gilles Deleuze and the psychoanalyst Félix Guattari thought that SAT is a quite singular mode of individuation, very different from that of a person, a subject, a thing, or a substance. I quote, a season, a winter, a summer, an hour, a date, have a perfect individuality. They are essays in the sense that they consist entirely of relations of movement and rest between molecules or particles, capacities to affect and to be affected. Concrete individuations that have a status of their own and direct the metamorphosis of things and subjects. Among types of civilizations, the Orient has many more individuations by SAT than by subjectivity or substantiality. The haiku, for instance, must include indicators as so many floating lines constituting a complex individual. In Charlotte Bronte, for instance, Everything is in terms of winds, things, people, faces, loves, words. Everything is in terms of wind. A degree of heat, 
and intensity of white are perfect individualities. A degree of heat can combine with an intensity of white, as in certain skies of a hot summer. This is in no way an individuality of the instant, as opposed to the individuality of permanences of durations. The individuation of a life is not the same as the individuation of the subject that leads it or serves as its support. It's not the same plane. We are talking about different planes. In the first case, it is the plane of consistency or of composition of SATs, which knows only speeds and affects. And in the second case, it is the altogether different plane of forms, substances, and subjects. And it's not the, in the same time, it's not the same temporality. End of quotation. In, contra, in contrast to Kronos, continue Deleuze and Guattari, the time of measure that situates things and persons develops a form and determines a subject. Eon is the indefinite time of the event, the floating time that knows only speeds and continually divides that which transpires into an already there that is at the same time not here yet, a simultaneous, too late and too early, a something that is both going to happen and has just happened. Thus, if we are talking about two modes of individuation and two modes of temporality, it seems that Ludovico's paintings belong to the plane of thisness, of SATs, since I quote, the SAT is connected with an atmospheric transformation in nature or in the mind, according to François Zurabichvili. In fact, in the case of Primavera, this exhibition, we are facing an atmospheric transformation in nature and in the mind. It's spring. And springtime rhymes at Darmstadt Kunsthalle. Even before entering the building, one can see that the fresh atmosphere of this season springs up and flows through the huge entrance wall, which becomes un amico delle acque, sort of pictorial statement that Ludovico borrowed from Bernini to drop her gorgeous hint of an Italian Baroque waterfall. Getting into it, crossing this waterfall, the viewer now finds himself surrounded by emerocalis, a series of canvases, 12 canvases, depicting 12 vibrant fields of day lilies. The plane, the plane of Primavera's essays becomes increasingly consistent as the viewer moves from one painting to the next. The atmosphere is silently changing all the time in such a disturbing way that the viewer senses the unsettling intensities operating the season's individuation inside himself and outside. Amazed, the viewer recalls emerocalis are ephemeral flowers that typically bloom for no more than 24 hours. Thus, the common name daily, daily. Opening up in the morning and withering during the forthcoming night, possibly replaced by another one on the same scape. Mm. 
yeah, they possibly replace it by another on the same scape the next day. The lilies have different colors and shapes, but here in the canvases, their mode of existence is reduced to their minimal expression. Just a degree of heat combined with an intensity of red, yellow, or blue, created by dabs, strokes, and splotches. In addition, every field, because we have 12 fields of Emerocalis in the main room, in addition, every field of Emerocalis is not numbered but given a subtle singularity in its title. Inspired perhaps by the poem Vowels by Rambo, A black, E white, I red, U green, O blue, the artist picks and chooses at every time a different character of the word emerocalis in order to play with a changing pronunciation of the word and to enhance a different colorful meaning. Call, lis, rock, arrow, calis, and so on. The more the viewer is absorbed by the fields of day lilies, by the plane of a Primavera's essays, the more subject and object of contemplation melt down and merge into one. A relationship where contemplation manifests and unfolds itself for itself. In such a process, the openness of sensibility is analogous to that experienced by the viewer facing Cezanne's paintings of Mont Saint Victoire. In both cases, one might say that what is taking place is the fusion of the magic of nature and the magic of painting. In an impressive essay written for the catalogue, Eva Vatolik described with refined accuracy the creative process in Ludovico's paintings. In her view, the artist like Cezanne and Kandinsky created a new type of abstract painting, a pictorial invention developed out of a study of nature. Her analysis appropriately evokes, evokes the Cezanne's series of Mont Saint Victoire, because in those paintings from 1880s onwards, the motif observed in nature becomes increasingly abstract on the canvases. In fact, in Ludovicus, as well in Cezanne's case, the painterly ab abstraction no longer de derives from the imitation of nature. It's not a sort of stylish reduction of natural forms or appearances. Going back to the origins of human perception and observation and back to the genesis of visual art, to the primordial oneness of strokes, of the founding act of painting, both artists encounter the essays that consist entirely in relations of movement and rest between molecules and, or particles, capacities to affect and be affected, as we saw in Deleuze and Guattari quotation. In that sense, Cezanne and Ludovico do not paint mountains and lilies, but the dynamics of movement and rest, the vibrations, the energy bringing mounts and flowers to existence, in nature as well as in the artist's vision and canvases. Last year, the Chinese philosopher Yu Hui published the book Art and Cosmotechnics, 
dedicated to elaborate on the relations between art and philosophy in European and in Chinese thinking. In order to establish the differences, but also the resonances between Eastern classical art and Western modern art, Hui privileges the study of Shan Shui, literally mountain and water, landscape paintings, and the works by Cezanne and Clay. The Chinese philosopher seems to have grasped the importance of such a relationship when he read the Swiss Chinese painter Zhao Wu Qi saying that it was Cezanne who taught him how to look at Chinese nature, to find himself, and to become a Chinese painter. In addition, as a shrewd reader of Heidegger, he chose those artists because the German philosopher had written some key texts on their work and their importance to his own philosophical search. Thus, through whose book, we become aware that upon encountering Cézanne's painting on Mont Sainte-Victoire, Heidegger felt a fraternal bond with the painter. I quote, it is said that during his visit to Aix-en-Provence, a place that Heidegger strangely claimed to be his second homeland, he went to view the mountain at the angle Cézanne painted from and said that Cézanne's was, quotation, the path to which from beginning to end my own path as a thinker responds, corresponds in its own way. That's end of quotation by Heidegger. What made Cézanne uh, so interesting to Heidegger, the philosopher of being, asks Yuk Hui. Analyzing Heidegger's poem titled Cézanne on his later painting, Le Jardinier Vallier, Hui discovers that what happens in the canvas namely Vallier and his relationship to the Chemin de Love, resonates with the text Der Feldweg, which Heidegger wrote in the late 40s. In both, what resonates is the field path. I quote Rui, a path that traver traverses history and reaches its proper place. Ort. It is a physical entity through which the farmer enters the field and the children pluck the first cow's lips on the edge of the meadow. It is also a message from the Ort, which the moderns no, long, no longer regard as a site, but only as a point on the globe. It is the message that the moderns refuse to hear since they listen to digital signs as if they were the voice of God. The Chemin de Love is comparable to the Feldweg in that it extends towards the death that Cézanne wants to paint. The death is the place from which this message is passed to the audience." End of quotation. Well, if we consider with Heidegger and Hui the paint, that painting can become a field path, in Cézanne's works, as well as in Ludovicus Emerocalis, then the abstraction at stake here seems to be extremely relevant, of vital importance. A field path to what? One might be tempted to ask. A field path to death. That is, to the encounter through ascetics with nature and life. In this sense, 
the field path of a work of art is a kind of operator leading to something which is there, not being there. Nature, life and cosmos are too big to be inframed in a canvas. But the power of the field path can open us to them by suspending our ordinary perception, by dissolving subject and object, and setting the creator as well as the viewer in, a, in an extraordinary larger plane that contains everything being manifested as vision. How does says, this operator work? Yuk Hui gives us a good description for Cezanne's painting, which also applies, I think, to Ludovico's creative process. He writes, quotation, Cezanne suspends the perception of things that are taken for granted. Cezanne wanted to paint the nature that hides itself away from traditional geometrical perspective. Cezanne wanted to live nature in his body and render nature visible through it by painting his sensation affected by nature. End of quotation. How can nature be rendered visible? It's not through imitation, of course. And there is, there is where abstraction comes in, not as abstraction of ideal or empirical form. As the painter Cezanne himself declared, the landscape thinks itself in me, and I am its consciousness. Le paysage se pense en moi, et je suis sa conscience. What matters then is the creation in nature and in the canvas of an atmosphere perpetually in motion. And what, that's why it appeared to me that it was important to draw attention to the way through which it makes its appearance in painting, what I called managing the flow instead of the form energy and rhythm in Ludovico's paintings. Yuk Hui is very helpful in that sense when he analyzes the role of qi, energy in Chinese, and yun, rhythm, in classical Chinese landscape painting. Qi, explains the philosopher, is the beauty of the yang of the work of art. Yun, is the beauty of the yin. Qi and yung, he adds, are analogical to brush and ink. Thus, energy is a matter of brush, rhythm a matter of ink. Together, qi yung constitutes the core of shan shui painting. Hui recalls the text Experiences in Painting by the art historian and connoisseur Guo Huoshu, circa 11th century, who claims that qi yun, energy and rhythm, cannot be taught as a technique, since it depends on the talent of the painter. For him, a good painter is able to create a dynamic between qi and yun that is devoid of formal imposition, that is without intention. But according to Hui, this does not mean without paying attention. On the contrary, it means one has to concentrate not on depicting the form, but on facilitating a flow of energy, stroke, and force. I quote, it is a flowing reciprocal dynamic. Present in the moment intention is in constant flux, 
when one is capable of managing the flow instead of the form, one also acquires the ability to react to contingencies depending on the propensity of things. Energy and rhythm, brush and ink. In the Emerocali series, as well as in the other abstract paintings of this exhibition, dabs, strokes, and or splotches, and movement and rest. That is Ludovico's paintings. A plane of consistency or of composition of assets which knows only speeds and affects. Considering the remarks by Guo Huoshu and Yu Hui, one thinks that the purpose of each brush stroke is not to represent something formed and given, but to leave a trace on the caverns destined to undo itself in order to reveal something beyond itself and beyond its own grasp. What could this revelation be? It seems that something being revealed is the opening to what cannot neither be seen or known. Mystery. I believe the best landscape painting resonates in Ludovico's canvases. According to the painter Yu Shu Bing, the best shan shui, the best landscape painting, Chinese landscape painting, would be one in which of a hundred thousand trees, none of the brush is tree. Of a hundred thousand mountains, none of the brush is mountain. Of a hundred thousand brushes, none of the brush is brush. When one sees something where there is, in fact, nothing, where there is nothing, where one sees something, this is the best painting. Thank you very much. <laughs> If you want to, to ask something. 